good morning to those of you in California and good afternoon to those of you I want to say in Chicago and the East Coast and Calispero to those of you in England and Greece. My name, as many of you know, is Sharon Gerstel and I'm director of the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for the study of Hellenic culture. I want to welcome you today to the first of our events for 2020-2021 academic year. We have a very packed and interesting schedule ahead of us and I hope you will be frequent participants in our Zoom and eventually, I say hopefully, uh, in our on-campus events. The UCLA campus may be closed, but the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center is definitely open. Today's stellar speaker is Dr. Jelena Harlaftis, Director of the Institute for Mediterranean Studies, located in the beautiful city of Rethim Nankrit. The Institute, which was founded in 1985, is one of the eight institutes of the Foundation for Research and Technology, ELAS, the leading research institution in Greece. The Institute's purpose is to promote research in the humanities, social sciences, as well as the application of science and technology to cultural heritage and the environment. It is particularly distinguished for its research in history and culture and for its excellence. The Institute has been awarded an unprecedented four European Research Council grants. We are very much looking forward to initiating a close working partnership with the Institute. Now, after spending part of her childhood in Monterey, California, Jelena Harlaftis graduated from the University of Athens and completed her graduate studies at the University of Cambridge and Oxford. A specialist in Greek maritime economic history, economic and social history, and diaspora history, her many books include The Present and the Future of Greek Shipping, Greek Seamen and Greek Steamships on the Eve of the First World War, and A History of Greek-Owned Shipping in the 19th and 20th Century. Her published articles, too many to even catalog in this brief introduction, reveal an astonishing breadth of interest ranging from 16th century Ottoman shipping up to shipping in the modern economy, sailing ships and steamships, family capitalism and diaspora networks. Today's lecture is based on her recently published monograph, Creating Global Shipping, Aristotle Onassis, the Valiano brothers, and the business of shipping circa 1820 to 1970. The book explores the evolution of the European shipping firm through the study of two Greek shipping houses, which provide a prime example of the regional European maritime businesses that evolved to serve Europe's international trade and eventually the global economy. And we are very pleased to have members of the Valiano family with us today. Reviewers of the book have called it, quote, an invaluable contribution, groundbreaking, and have praised the meticulous research. One reviewer observed that the stories of the two families would make great subjects for novels. We will have time for questions and discussion following the lecture. At that time, please write your questions in the chat function of Zoom or raise your hand to be recognized. Now, it is my great pleasure to invite Jelena Harlaftis to educate us about a topic that she knows so well, creating global shipping from the Valiano brothers to Aristotle Onassis. Jelena. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and uh, um, thank you very much for inviting me in this uh, series of lectures and uh, have the opportunity to meet you all, even if it is a screen. I wish uh, I were there in LA to meet uh, many of you uh, uh, in person, but certainly hopefully we'll do this. Um, let me share the screen. Um, yeah. yeah, so here we are. Um, 
And uh, I would uh, like uh, very much to thank the UCLA SNF Center for Study of Hellenic Culture and of course Sharon Gerstel for all the efforts she makes and uh, for the opportunity you give me to present uh, uh, this work. This uh, uh, study explores the, uh, 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 the evolution of the European shipping firm through the study of two Greek shipping firms, which provide the prime example of the regional European maritime businesses that evolved to serve Europe's international trade and eventually the global economy. The Valiano brothers indicate how Greek shipping underwent transformation from local shipping and trading to international shipping and ship management. The Onassis case indicates how international shipping was transformed to global uh, shipping business. Now, what is new about this book? Uh, you will not hear about Jackie or Maria Callas or anything about lifestyle of Onassis or the lifestyle of the Valianos. This is the study of two companies in a comparative perspective. And uh, uh, usually in business history, one looks at uh, one, uh, uh, at one uh, 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 company. This book is about two companies and two centuries. It is a study of the evolution, not only of Greek, but also of European shipping company. And it examines how these two companies evolved as agents of the integration and globalization of the world economy how Greeks in the south of Europe contributed to the evolution of regional European maritime businesses to serve the global economy, and how Greeks, by serving the sea routes of the major economic powers of the time, the British and the Russians from the 1820s, and this is the Valianos uh, 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 serving British and Russian trade, and then the United States, it's Onassis that's serving uh, 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 the American uh, uh, oil trade, uh, that these two, how they contributed in creating the global shipping industry. And it reveals the, uh, from inside how this was done. Let me uh, uh, also uh, see how much time I talk, because if you let me, I can go on forever. So on this one. Now, I'm not going to burden you with uh, uh, lots of uh, diagrams here, but just to give you an idea of, of shipping in order to understand what these uh, two companies were doing. Uh, uh, world shipping is, uh, is, is divided in two big markets uh, since the uh, mid uh, 19th century. Liner shipping, which is now what you see container shipping. This is what we call the buses of the oceans, they go New York to Calcutta. The, for example, the ship, whether it is, uh, it, is uh, it has a uh, cargoes or not. And the trunk shipping, which is on demand. Now, Greeks are doing, I mean, carrying cargoes on demand. And Greeks are into uh, trunk shipping. Uh, I have, uh, uh, I have, uh, I'm showing in this diagram in theme four periods uh, before the 1830s, from 1830s to 1870s, this is all sailing ship period. And then from 1880s to 1930s, that goes to steamships. And then 1940s to 1970s, this is the new era of, uh, uh, um, of oil and uh, uh, tankers. Now, uh, this is uh, the, uh, in the diagram, you see how the Valianos were involved in, three, in, in, in the three periods. Uh, like just in the 1820s, they entered and they were sailing uh, ship captains and they became sailing ship owners. And then they formed a trading company in the uh, 1850s, an international trading company, which had ships and did commerce as well. And then they pioneered in forming in London a ship management company, which was a new modern thing to do at the time. But the Onassis is uh, involved in the two last periods. Uh, he gets into shipping in 1930s and uh, goes up to a 1970s. Now, I had great fun writing this book. Um, I spent, my, my, my friends uh, uh, were uh, making fun of me, I think, for many years as I had, I was saying I had my four boyfriends. 
So uh, let me introduce them to you. This is Marie Valiano, the oldest of the three Valiano brothers coming from Kefalonia. He was born in the beginning of, 19th, uh, of 19th century and he was established in Russia. This is uh, uh, Panagi Valiano, the second one, who was uh, 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 um, uh, also a captain and established in uh, uh, Dante and then in London. And then Andre Valiano, who was uh, uh, a captain as well and was established first in Constantinople and then in Marseille. And this, of course, uh, you know, this is Aristotle and Assis. So I had to travel a lot. Uh, it was good that uh, we're able to do a lot of uh, archival research in Russia. This is the Black Sea and this is uh, Southern Russia. And uh, I have uh, been there to uh, Tangarok where he was and then to Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, okay, the Greek archives in Marseille in uh, London, in Norway, and in New York to do research and assemble the small pieces in order to make the, the big puzzle of their story. They were billionaires. These, uh, when the Valiano died, in uh, the last Valiano died in 1903, with value of 2018, they left uh, uh, two billion, uh, over $2 billion uh, of uh, uh, assets. And when uh, Onassis died in 1975, he left $2.7 billion. So we're talking about a lot of money. Let's start with Marie. Marie Valiano has been called the Tsar of South Russia. Every morning, uh, one of the newspapers of the contemporary uh, newspapers were writing, Sior uh, Marakis, uh, as he was called in the Kefalonian idiom, stood in front of his door as Russian peasants and the employees of landowners paraded in front of him, holding samples of grain in his palm and uh, uh, in his palm and grain still in his palm he would turn and say to his employee who was standing next to him keeping notes for purchase not for purchase for purchase not for purchase he sent millions of tons of grain to all parts of the globe through his palm a greek newspaper wrote marie valiano lived in tangarok for 70 years he right he, he he died almost 90 years old this is his home in Tagarok is still there and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. I mean, Tagarok is an amazing uh, uh, town in the, sea, in the Sea of Azov and it's, it still has all these houses of large Greek merchants. It's also the town of Anton Chekhov who also knew Marie Valiano. Uh, and this, it was very moving, I have to say, in 2016, when I went uh, 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 around the cemetery of, uh, uh, of Taganrog with many, many uh, 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 graves of, uh, uh, of merchants and their family. And this is the uh, grave of uh, the 17-year-old daughter Aspasia. He, it was Marie Valiano's first child, and he had another two sons. Uh, the, the Valianos came from the village in Kefalonia called Keramie. Now, this area called Levatho is an area of about 25 villages, and it is called the Naftomana, the mother of uh, sailors of Kefalonia. Uh, these are the areas where they have a lot of ship owners and sailors come from. But uh, the Valianos came from this uh, small island. And you can see where Taganrok is. Uh, it, was, it has been described by, uh, by Russian uh, writers as the kingdom of the Greeks because the, a, a large number of Kefalonians, and not only Kefalonians, uh, were uh, established in Taganrok. This is an area that the Russians took after the end of the 18th century, and there was, uh, uh, it was all, only, only steps, no, no cities, and it, the Russian Empire established all these cities, and there are cities of immigrants, so a, a lot of, uh, of people coming in, and a lot of Greeks as well going in this area, so Tagarok, and there is Kefalonia. 
Now, Taganrog, which you see here, and this is the Sea of Vazov, and this is the Black Sea, and here over here is Constantinople, the Dardanelles coming in from the Aegean. Now you go and you see Taganrog, and you don't realize the vast Russian hinterland, right? This is an amazing area uh, where it was all cultivation of grain. They just be this became the uh, grain producer of all Western Europe. They produced, uh, the, uh, the, they were the biggest producers in the world and, the, and grain was sent to the industrializing uh, Western Europe and it was Greek ships that carried most of this grain. Right? So Tagarok and Rostov here on Don, so it has Volga and Don, thousands of miles of, of uh, rivers and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, uh, grain coming down on, on rivers and on uh, um, cartridges, carriages uh, through land. And the Valianos had uh, this, uh, this, all the dots, all the black dots show you from the archives, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, um, connections, the agents of the Valianos. And uh, we have categorized them. They had uh, original uh, uh, agencies in all the cities in the Azov. They had uh, 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 here peripheral um, uh, agencies in all the main cities like Odessa. Okay, Sebastopol, this is the Danube here, Breila and Tulsa. This is Romania and Bulgaria here, Burgas and Constantinople. Uh, of course, in all the islands and main cities of uh, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, Northeastern Mediterranean, and also in Trieste, in Geneva, in Marseille, in Ravre, in Paris, in Rotterdam, London, Manchester, all right? So this is the international network. Andrea Valiano. Andrea Valiano was the young, uh, he had 20 years of difference with his uh, uh, brother, Marie, whom he considered as his father. He left 14 years old from, from, uh, uh, from Kefalonia and became a very, he was a talented merchant captain. And in, 19, in 1850, he was established in Constantinople where he married uh, 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 Ethrosini Mela, member of the of the of a very known Greek family, the Melas family, Pavlos Melas, and so on. They are from this family. Uh, Ethrosini Mela. They they had uh, the, be the 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 most uh, 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 the biggest family of uh, all three Valianos. They had about ten children. And uh, um, he was first established in Constantinople and then in Marseille. Panagi Valiano was the middle brother between Marie and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Andrea, also a merchant captain, and, uh, uh, and he, he and ship owner with his brothers, and uh, uh, he was first established in uh, Zakynthos in Zante uh, in 18, uh, late 1840s uh, and 1850s, and after the Crimean War in 1856, he went to the city of London. And he collaborated with the Bank of England, uh, the Valiano brothers. It is written that he had a, a company with his, of course, with all the, the three brothers had an international company. And uh, uh, he, in, 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 he became one of the biggest bankers in the city of London in 1881. He had a turnover of eight million pounds, an incredible amount at that time. And they were comparable with the Shredders that had 4 million turnover and the Rothschilds of London that had about 12 million uh, 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 pounds of turnover in London. He was instrumental in financing the transition from sail to seam. All the brothers, but particularly uh, 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 Panagis at the, uh, in the 1890s. And he has been described as the patriarch of Greek shipping because of that. Uh, this is actually a photograph. It wonder it is in, in the in the in the in the in the all in the home in the Yirokomio of uh, Kefalonia, uh, which was uh, a donation uh, from the Valiano uh, Foundation, as I'll say later. Now, why were the Valianos so important? The Valianos managed to become the largest international export trading company of Russia. We have numbers for all Russia. And uh, they were the biggest grain exporters uh, in uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, empire. 
they became the largest Trump shipping company. They, at a certain point, they had 80 sailing ships. That is an incredible number. And they had about uh, 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 20, 25 steamships, which is also an incredible fleet for, the, uh, for that, those, that time. And of course, they made the largest brick bank banking company of the city of London in the last third of the 19th century. Uh, in order to become a successful uh, entrepreneur, you have to make innovations uh, and, uh, and, and, and the Valianos were part uh, of, the, of the European uh, economy of that time and, uh, the global, uh, and, and its uh, the globalization. So they formed, uh, a, they formed a central agency uh, in, uh, in, in London uh, that functioned from, not only in London, in, in Russia, in Marseille, in Tagarok, in Marseille and in London. It was one central agency in a way that functioned from these nodal points and other as well nodal points and provided services to a plethora, to hundreds of Greek shipping companies that were established in the small islands. We have a very uh, extensive, since I, there is a lot of spetses here, there's an extensive uh, uh, collaboration of, the, of Mari Valiano, for example, with the Kutsis brothers in spetses or, and with other ship, uh, spetsiot uh, ship owners. But not only that, as well from Andros, uh, from Ithaca, from other, uh, from other uh, uh, islands, Santorini, from all islands in Greece where uh, international uh, uh, shipping uh, companies were, with, which were really uh, 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 sailing ships with, uh, 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 or families with one or two or three sa sailing ships. The Valianos did timely adoption to new technology ships. They were, uh, they, they were uh, uh, the transition from sail to steam in the British fleet happened in the 1870s. Despite the fact that the steamships were, were invented in the 1810s, the really in, 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 in merchant shipping, they, they, they were able to replace their sailing ships in the, in the 18, late 1870s, 1880s. And this is when the Valianos bought their first steamships. They provided shipping finance. They, they, they worked as, as well as bankers for, for Greek ship owners. So if they wanted to buy either sailing ships or steamships, they were uh, uh, getting loans from the Valianos. And then uh, they created uh, at the end of, uh, in the second half actually of the, of the 20th century from the 1856s to 1903, the first London office. Now, a London office is an office that uh, is a, it became a, like a hybrid management office, meaning that it, it managed its own ships, but also managed the ships of others. Okay, and uh, 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 when uh, Panagi Valiano, who was the last Valiano, died in 1903, there were uh, there was uh, 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 three uh, offices, uh, one of Valiano and two that sprung out of the Valiano, and then uh, another uh, 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 20 offices became, uh, uh, start, started functioning on the lines of what the Valiano had set. And the, in one of the, from one of these offices, uh, Onassis uh, started and learned his business. What connects the Valianos and Onassis is that they had uh, 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 they 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 uh, followed uh, um, uh, innovative steps uh, each one in his own epoch that can be compared. For example, they had a geographic expansion of business of of, of managing their business from many nodal points. They uh, uh, innovate. They were innovators in ship management. They opened new finance. Uh, the Valianos with uh, themselves using various new tools for the time and also from London. Uh, Onassis opened uh, for international shipping uh, the American market for the first time with the Citibank uh, of New York. Uh, uh, in, they developed new markets. The Valianos opened really a new market, uh, which was the grain market from Russia. And, uh, and spread it uh, to the rest of the world. Onassis uh, with tankers and oil. 
they both were able to purchase ships at a time when uh, ships were quite cheap and, and there was a crisis. So they were able to, to buy cheap and, 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 and sell dearly. Uh, they, uh, they followed, uh, uh, the Kefalonia has a great maritime tradition. Uh, it was, uh, um, uh, I, I, I do not start from ancient times because I am a, a modern a, a history historian, but it is Kefalonia, uh, 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 we have traced from the 18th century that it really stood out and not only from 18th century, it's also before, but this is where we can see a large fleet uh, uh, under uh, uh, the, uh, in the Ionian Islands. So you have, but also, you, you, uh, yes, and you have a, a, a very important tradition of Kefalonia in, 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 in shipping and also Ithaca. Now, Onassis uh, 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 used all Ithacan seamen, Ithacan uh, uh, um, uh, employees. So he was able to use the Ithacan maritime tradition for various reasons of, of this time because uh, Ithacan uh, ship owners were not successful after the Second World War and Onassis was able to use this know-how. And they were both attacked, both Onassis and, uh, and Valianos were both attacked from governments in which uh, 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 in their host countries and uh, they were both able to survive on uh, an international level despite the problems they faced. Now, it is very interesting to see that uh, Marie Valiano in Russia in the, 80, in 18, in the 1880s was uh, 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 attacked by the Russian government and they took him to court in a, in, a, in a famous, in an infamous uh, uh, trial, uh, uh, which was uh, uh, described as the, uh, the scandal of the Tagarok customs. Uh, 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 Alexander, this happened in a change of governments. Alexander III came after the, the, uh, uh, the death of his father, Alexander II, who was a, a much more liberal uh, emperor. He wanted assimilation, homogenization, and uh, uh, of, of the population of Russia and Southern Russia that was full of immigrants and minorities. And he attacked the very, uh, the very uh, uh, rich minority of Tagarok, uh, and particularly Marie Valiano. And uh, uh, at the end, uh, nothing happened to Marie Valiano. He was, not, uh, 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 he was not found guilty. He paid a fine for some minor thing and he stayed for another uh, 20 years in Tagarok. Uh, 70 years uh, uh, afterwards, it was the American government that uh, attacked Onassis and also a, a group of very rich uh, uh, Greek ship owners in New York. Uh, and it was again a change of government from Democrats uh, uh, to Republicans. And it had to do as well with embarrassing the previous government and, and also during a time of crisis as it was as well at the time of the 1880s in Russia as well after the Korean War in, uh, uh, in America. And uh, uh, nothing has got, uh, again uh, uh, happened uh, to Onassis. Uh, 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 he was not, they were not able to take him to court. We can talk about it, you can read more about it, but we can certainly say that uh, if you look at them a little bit in a macroscopic way, you can say that uh, uh, throughout history, it is a, a, a clear case how powerful governments have attacked entrepreneurial elites uh, of foreign origin during periods of increasing nationalism and xenophobia, and, uh, but global shipping businesses indicate that the ability and flexibility to legally bypass those government and national interests using uh, 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 the, uh, the, all the infrastructure and the legal system uh, in Russia as Marie Valiano did and uh, in uh, the United States as Onassis did. Uh, on uh, uh, January 1st, 2000, in uh, Lloyd's List, which is the most important uh, uh, shipping journal uh, since uh, uh, the 18th century, in the front page uh, it was written, Giants Who Changed the Face of Shipping, and uh, there was of course a, a large picture of Aristotle Onassis, and he was, uh, uh, um, he was, uh, um, uh, um, described as the ship owner of the 20th century. 
uh, when Onassis died in 1975, the 10 largest tanker companies of the world were three Greeks, Onassis, the Lemos, and the Gulandris, two from Hong Kong, uh, Chinese, uh, two from Japan, and YK and Sanko, one American, Daniel Ludwig, and uh, one Norwegian, Bergesen, and one Danish, the Maersk. When Anassas was born, uh, uh, tw uh, uh, actually two years after the last Valianos died, uh, he, so like 70, uh, 70 years before, uh, the biggest ship owning groups in the world were British, all of them, Peninsula and Oriental, the Royal Mail, Ellerman, Cunard, uh, uh, Ocean Steamship, the British tanker, Anglo-Saxon Petroleum, and two German. So it is clear that something happened in, in, in the world from the beginning of the 20th century to the mid, uh, after the mid 20th century. And Anasis belongs to these new men that changed post-World War II shipping and created the new state of things. And uh, Michael Miller, a, in a wonderful book, uh, has, is describing uh, that, and he uh, uh, certainly mentions Onassis as well uh, in this respect. Um, now, uh, you might not know that uh, despite the crisis, despite our problems, despite being uh, uh, not one of the uh, richest the countries in Europe, we have the biggest fleet in the world right now. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is run uh, uh, from Greece. 80% uh, of Greek ship owners are, uh, uh, are in Greece now. Uh, and uh, as agencies of their uh, ships and, uh, and so on. And what we call beneficial ownership, which is uh, 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 ships under many flags, but owned by Greeks. Uh, they, uh, we own 17% uh, of world shipping, and uh, uh, that's in 2018, followed by Japan, China, and Germany. Onassis built a global shipping business, and uh, he ran, uh, he made uh, Panamanian, Liberian, American, Argentinian, Norwegian, Swedish, and Greek companies. His uh, ships ca uh, carried the Panamanian, Honduran, Liberian, but also American, Greek, Swedish, Norwegian, Saudi Arabian flags. He uh, 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 employed mainly Greek, but also Uruguayan, American, English, French, and German managers. He hired mainly Greek crews, but also German and Norwegian ones. And he operated from Latin America, North America, and Europe. And this is a global shipping company with a Greek heart in inverted commas attached to the European maritime culture. Uh, there are stories where you have a Liberian, uh, a, a tanker of Onassis with a Liberian, uh, uh, with a Liberian flag, but with the Onassis uh, uh, Olympic uh, uh, circles uh, uh, um, uh, on his ships uh, uh, going out of Rotterdam and in Rotterdam, in the port of Rotterdam, it is a tradition that, that every time that the ship uh, 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 leaves, that the a national anthem uh, of, the, of the flag of the ship, of the ship is, is uh, they play that. And uh, when a, a, an Anasis tanker would go out, they would be playing the Greek national anthem despite uh, the flag. And that was not only for Anasis, for every Greek owned uh, uh, a ship, right? Uh, and and uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is what uh, uh, Greek seamen are, uh, testimonies from Greek seamen. Now, Onassis business. Uh, I, uh, um, I have to say that uh, I was very, very lucky in uh, um, being able to use the Onassis business archive which, and I'm very grateful to the Onassis Foundation because they gave me full access to it. And uh, I have come to New York, uh, uh, to the States to do research here, uh, but uh, the Onassis Foundation has gathered all the material of or all the uh, documents and the books uh, of the 200 and so companies of Onassis uh, uh, from Montevideo, which was one of the bases uh, of his uh, companies of Monte Carlo uh, and from Piraeus. 
Uh, this is so uh, we were able to uh, to do um, uh, we're, we're carrying out now uh, a project since 2017 uh, in uh, cataloging and classifying uh, uh, the Onassis archive, which was all in many uh, warehouses and uh, constructing really the first shipping archive uh, through uh, the Institute. Uh, uh, funded by the Onassis Foundation. Uh, this has cost us. Uh, we do not treat as badly our uh, young uh, crew, but uh, uh, he's uh, uh, proud to show off how much he can carry. But you can see how we are, this is in the process, the, uh, the archive in the process of making. And I'm writing a second uh, book. The whole group is writing a second uh, book on Onassis businesses, uh, including Olympic Airways and so on. Why Onassis was important? Onassis was one of the pioneers, if not the leader, into making the global shipping business. And this is recognized by the whole uh, world of shipping. And uh, his main innovations is that he pioneered in forming, developing, and consolidating the model of organization and management of global shipping companies. Second, he, as I said, he was the first to open the United States financial markets to ship finance. He contributed to the evolution of ship technology and gigantism. Uh, he reinvented Greek maritime tradition as he was the one to form a, 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 from an island shipping culture, a shipping company culture. I have no time to tell uh, to discuss all of these uh, 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 to you, but I will focus in the first one about his model because it's very uh, interesting. Uh, so the model uh, uh, which every now Greek, what I'm going to show you is that Onassis first built and uh, uh, everybody imitated him uh, uh, since then. And this is now how uh, the shipping companies around the world are run. So it is uh, using multi-holding offshore companies. Second, flags of convenience. And third, management from many locations. Multiple holding offshore companies. Now, offshore companies are adopted by all multinational companies now. But the use of offshore companies, it, which is a common practice today, used by most, many businesses and businessmen in international businesses, back in the 1940s and 50s, in the nation-centered post-World War II world, the practice of using offshore companies was a novelty and considered even an anomaly by nation states and state administrators. This is the model. I, if, uh, let, let, us, let us see it. This is the internal architecture of the, of, of the, of the group of companies of Onassis, and this is the management. Now, in the internal architecture, it is the ownership that we're talking about, and the external architecture has to do with the management. The world sees that. What, this is what is not seen. And when a ship is usually for every purchase of a ship, he made a new company. And this is, was a daughter company called a C uh, daughter company. This daughter company was owned by a mother company. And this mother company was owned by a grandmother company. He had only three grandmother companies that owned the whole system, but he might have, but he had about 180 of these co uh, companies. But, uh, and here in the external architecture, I'm sorry about the spelling mistake here. So it's at the ant, the ant companies are the ones that were the agencies, the windows to the world. And those ones, the cousin companies were, no, sorry, the cousin companies were the agencies, which is, as I said, the windows to the world in Monte Carlo, in New York, his agencies in which uh, uh, interacted with everybody else. And these aunts were the ones, at companies that bought the ships, that took the loans and chartered the ships. So if, if you're, if you're uh, uh, confused, this is the idea to make uh, 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 people confused uh, and uh, uh, not to get to the, uh, to the ownership. So let us take an example. And this is the ownership and management of the tanker Olympic Flame, right? 
Olympic flame was built in the shipyards of, uh, of Bremen, right? So they, he made a company called Seaford Marine Panama, and Seaford Marine Panama owned Olympic flame. But Seaford Marine Company, Pan, uh, Seaford Marine was owned by company Aristomenes. And that company Aristomenes was owned by Miraflores. And this one was only that Donassis was seeing. And Olympic Flame was managed by the Olympic Maritime uh, 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 Agency in Monte Carlo, by the Central American Agency in New York, by the Olympic Maritime in Paris, by the Olympic Maritime in London, by Springfield in Piraeus, and home in Montevideo. And these were the ant companies that were making the purchase and, and so on. So what we have found out in the archive uh, 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 is that Onassis had, uh, 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 had made 205 uh, companies to run his business. Uh, they're all Panama and Liberian companies. So this is Onassis here. He has the three grandmothers that, uh, uh, that uh, have uh, uh, owned everything. And these ones own the mother companies, the, uh, the daughter companies. And this is, and all the management is done by these companies. So, the, so this model here, as I said, is used now by, uh, the, this is called the multi-holding uh, 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 model of, co of companies. And this is what uh, is used by shipping companies and not only by shipping companies. Uh, airlines, uh, transport, and uh, everything else, and name it. So the institution, uh, 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 this is a, a small, uh, just to uh, let you uh, understand as well, the sort of uh, confusion that was happening uh, uh, in the 1950s, is that uh, all these uh, Panamanian and Liberian companies, all the offshore companies are Societe Anonyme. They are incorporated companies, but they are not in the stock exchange. The share, uh, and if you, if, if in Europe, for example, you have a, a, a Societe Anonyme and is not, uh, uh, and in the United States as well, uh, if, if it is not introduced in the stock exchange, then the share has to have the name of the owner. But in the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, for the, in the case of Panamanian and Liberian companies, the shares are anonymous, despite the fact that, that they are not entered in the stock exchange. The taxes are paid, but there are small taxes and there are fixed fees to Liberia or Panama. And there is less state regulation and books do not need to be inspected. And of course, they provide invisibility and flexibility in this way. Uh, from Onassis hearing that was taken in the U.S. government, uh, you can, there is the U.S. congressman, and they tried to find out whether Onassis owns a, a company named Ariona. That has, it's a case with ships, I won't uh, 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 confuse you with it, but uh, I, I think you'll understand uh, the confusion of this, uh, of, 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 of to the United States uh, statesman uh, by the fact that he was using to such an extent offshore companies. Zelenko is a US uh, congressman. He asked uh, Onassis, Gives us, uh, give us your exact interest in Ariona, is an Onassis company. How much you own, what company it is, Onassis. I can't tell you exact, sir, but very close to exact. Ariona is a Panamanian corporation. And I think at the moment I own about 85% of the stock. Zelenko, in your name, Onassis. No, name of another corporation, which end up with me, Zelenko. In what corporation's name do you have your interest in Ariona, Onassis? You're asking quite technical things. There are 70 some corporations. I can't remember exactly, Zelenko. Do you have an interest in your name in Ariona, Onassis? I don't remember, Zelenko. Do you know where the books of Ariona are, Onassis? I have to look into the records. He was playing here. Zelenko, where are the records, Onassis? Down in South America, sir. Zelenko, I want to know, Mr. Onassis, whether you have any stock or interest in Ariona in your own name. That is the basis of the chairman's ruling, Onassis. I have more than the majority stock. 
I said almost 85 or 90% Zelenko in your name, Onassis, whether it is my own name or through another corporation who stock in my own name, that is a detail which I cannot answer because I do not know. Onassis was not saying lies here. It is the, the, the multi-holding company model uh, which was all too complicated and which also saved him in uh, to take him uh, to the court uh, by the American state. So uh, he used flags of convenience. Uh, uh, this is uh, it's called today open registry. They, uh, they were a lot attacked in the 1950s. After 1980s, everybody uses them. Uh, for example, you can see the Liberty Aristoteles purchased in 1946. It was owned by the company Columbia Marine, which was owned by Aristomenes and by the Miraflores. It hoisted the Honduran flag from 1946 to 1958. It changed uh, to the Greek flag from 1960 uh, 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 to 65, then to Liberian flag and so on. So they provided flexibility. Here you can see how today the world, this is 2018. And if you see the, how the world uh, fleet here, you can see that Panama has the biggest fleet in the world, Marshall Islands, Liberia, Hong Kong. But these, oh, the owners of these fleet are not Pan Panamanians or Liberians. They're Greeks, Japanese, Chinese, Germans, Singaporeans, uh, uh, Koreans, uh, United Americans, right? Now, the other thing that Onassis did was management from many locations. There were two poles of management, Monte Carlo, which everybody knew, and Montevideo, which very few people knew, but also in London, Paris, New York, Paris, and so on. So to conclude on, 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 on Onassis making this modern model, he used multiple offshore companies, which was very new at that time, he used uh, flags of convenience, which were not used to such an extent during that time. He managed a shipping group for many locations, and everybody imitated him after that. And although the above practices were not invented by Onassis, he was the first worldwide in the shipping business to put them all together, and by combining offshore companies, European maritime expertise, and American finance, he drew this model of the global shipping business. And to, to conclude this lecture, I just uh, want to tell you about the aftermath, a little bit about Anassis Foundation, by Valiano Foundation and Anassis Foundation. The Valiano legacy, the, our Greek National Library, which now has become, uh, is now the uh, Nyarkos Library. It's interesting to see that the, the, uh, the Greek National Libraries were donated by Greek ship owners. So now it's been, they still, they call it Valianios because here it says Valianios and this is Panagi Valiano and entering uh, the beautiful building here of our old national library. You can see Marie on the left and then Andrea on the right in, in big statues. And they donated uh, the money to make during the time of Spiridon Tricupis to make the library. And Panagi Bagliano, when he died, he donated, he made uh, one fifth of his, uh, of his uh, uh, money. He donated to make a, 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 the foundation, the Bagliano, a fourth, one fourth of his, uh, 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 the, he bequeathed to a, a foundation in Kefalonia. And he really took all the social welfare of the island from 1910s to 1950s. Commercial school, you can see there, a hospital with, uh, uh, with a mental hospital, a, a children's hospital, a, a, a cardiological hospital, and so on. Uh, and many other schools, unfortunately, they were all destroyed in the 1956 earthquake. The sons, so the, he, uh, the eight nephews inherited the last, he was the last to die in 1903, and uh, eight nephews inherited him and the others. Uh, uh, so that is Alcibiades, which is the son of Marie. He was born in Russia and he went uh, near Panayi and uh, uh, spent the time with him, uh, uh, worked with him actually 25 years. Married to this uh, lovely lady, Angeliki Bali, of a uh, Greek merchant in London, 
this is a picture by a photographer called Lafayette, who also photographed uh, a Victoria, the uh, Queen Victoria. So all the ladies of the of the uh, 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 new uh, uh, upper class of uh, London were photographed by her. Athanasios uh, Valiano went to Paris and he also married uh, a lady from a, a very important uh, uh, Greek family called the well, commercial aristocracy, Katina Rally. Uh, grandsons were uh, rich people, they're all, all millionaires here. And this is the family of Marino, uh, of, of, of Athanasio San Marino in, uh, uh, in south of France. They lived in a, a famous Villa Chanfleury. This is Helen Valiano, who uh, was uh, uh, distinguished for her uh, action during the Second World War in French resistance and was killed by Germans. Uh, this is the descendants of Andrea Valiano, uh, who was established in uh, Marseille. And this is his wife, uh, Efrosini Mela, uh, uh, and uh, this is his son Marino. And his, this is the engagement of Marino and Lolia. Here is the beautiful Lolia, a uh, descendant of Petro Cochino. And here are the grandsons of Andrea Valiano. This is Andre Valiano, uh, and who uh, was a golf champion, and his daughter Lali, also a golf champion. There is uh, today still running a women's golf, the Valiano Trophy. And this is his sister, married to a Marquise. All the French branch was married to a uh, French aristocracy. Uh, many of them, that is. Uh, other Valiano nephews, he was uh, uh, in Bonovorosisk, and after the death of his, uh, uh, of his uh, uncle, he went uh, to Monte Carlo, and he was famous in to becoming playing with uh, uh, Andres Introen uh, and uh, all the very famous rich people in the casino there. Are they remembered? Well, the Greek shipping world remembers very well the Valiano brothers, and they are called the patriarchs of Greek shipping. They're entered in the Hall of Fame that has been uh, uh, made for all the uh, Greek uh, uh, great ship owners of the 19th, 20th, and 21st century. And they continue, they continue into shipping through the women, the Valiano women that were married to Licardopoulou, a family coming from Kefalonia. Here is Athanasius Valianos with Nicolas Licardopoulou. And this is uh, uh, the uh, Licardopoulou ship owning uh, group is a very important group and still uh, uh, going today. Uh, the Onassis legacy, you will have the Onassis estate was, uh, was uh, divided into two. Christina took, uh, uh, and then her daughter Athena took half of it. And the other half uh, that was going to go to his son Alexander that died went to the Alexander Onassis Foundation. And the Alexander Onassis Foundation has a, a really, uh, um, I'm not sure there is any other kind of a foundation like this, but it is a foundation that runs a fleet that has a business and this business gives money to the Public Benefit Foundation today, right? So uh, this is Christina and Alexander in a launching of a tanker. And this is his family that does not exist at all in their business anymore because they took their money, uh, uh, Athena's daughter. And this is the Onassis, Onassis business family he really made, uh, a, 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 it's amazing, he made a, 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 a wheel like a, a business, okay? And a, a large number of, of, of his, uh, well, uh, this is the semen that come from Ithaca here. This is Stelios Papadimitriou, uh, president of the, uh, the previous president of the Onassis uh, Foundation. And today, the Cardiological Center, the Stegi, uh, and uh, the shipping company that has a large O that's in Paleofaliro. And today the fleet comprises of 21 crude oil tankers and 10 dry bulk carriers with a total capacity of 6 million still, still running the flag of Onassis uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the oceans. Uh, 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 tankers with the Onassis flag are still sailing the routes around the world. And finally, is he remembered? Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of all this because uh, uh, Onassis, is, is, this is another talk, has become a, a popular hero in Greece. 
but uh, he's remembered as a, a wonderful boss as from what I have uh, interviewed many, many people. When the ship steward Christos Triandis died in 2000 in the town of Mitikas in the Ionian Sea, only 11 miles from Scorpios, the Onassis Island, his coffin was wrapped in the Onassis shipping flag before it was inter in interred. About five or six years late, earlier, he had asked Captain Gerasimus Barkas, head of the Marine Department of Springfield Shipping Company of the Onassis shipping business for such a flag. He told his relatives that after his death, everyone should remember that he was an Onassis man. Thank you very much.